and just a throwback to April in Chicago when I had the absolute privilege to see Dr. Murganathan and Dr. Maheshwari at the wonderful India chapter reception. And with that, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Great, thank you so much. So just want to make some disclosures initially as we get started, just to clarify, I am an adjunct clinical associate professor with SIU School of Medicine, um, although my primary affiliation actually is as a scientific editorial director for JMIR Publications. Um, that being said, uh, my affiliations uh, today, the views and opinions that I express today in my presentation are my own and not representative of any of the affiliations or organizations that I am affiliated with. Thank you. Um, some of the slides today I'll also present are from materials that I helped to collect for the American College of Physicians with respect to promoting well-being and professional satisfaction. So what is resilience? Uh, when I hear resilience, it reminds me of the days when I studied uh, biomedical engineering and material sciences. Some of you may be familiar with this concept already. But the idea that there is this sort of stress strain curve on materials, but in this case, we're actually talking about people, right? But that there are external stressors, external factors that contribute to or affect our well being. We adapt to those strains and then we keep going. But then what happens after that when the stress has become too much? So, this is a nice summary of what happens at the end of that curve, of the stress strain curve that I showed on the previous slide. The tragedy of adaptability is that people are the most adaptable element in any complex system. And healthcare systems are, of course, complex systems that we function within. Um, and that adaptability is essential in making things work oftentimes, right? When we're working in our day-to-day -day practice, we often encounter scenarios that were unexpected or additional complications have arisen. But in, even, uh, in both the ordinary and extraordinary circumstances, it's important to be adaptable but that isn't always visible to outsiders. Additionally, that adaptability is finite, as we've experienced again during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, it often leads to workarounds that may, be, that may lead to unforeseen risks of their own and often can't be sustained for prolonged periods of time. So what happens at the end of that stress strain curve? You sort of saw it go up, there's the adaptability, the change, and then there's a certain point where it sort of tips down again. There's this sense that there's this perceived chain reaction between experiencing burnout, becoming clinically depressed, and then leading to worst case scenarios such as suicidal ideations and even suicide deaths. Um, here are numbers from US resident physicians. This is obviously, like I said, it's not a causative chain, but it's often one that we worry about a lot. Um, and actually I do look forward to the presentation tomorrow as well with regards to the studies that, that study that has been done in this chapter, in the ACP India chapter around well-being, um, for partly this reason. Of course, this doesn't discount the fact that burnout rates are high among U.S. residents. I imagine they may be the same here as well. Um, depression screens among residents also can be uh, positive at a high rate. Uh, and yet, as you go on and further to suicidal ideations and suicide deaths, they become much more rare events. But each one is a tragedy. So what is resilience? I like this definition from Dr. Mukta Panda, who is our um, ACP Global Engagement Committee Chair. Um, she is also a professor of medicine at University of Tennessee College of Medicine and an Assistant Dean for Wellbeing and Medical Student Education. She defines resilience as the ability to recharge, recover, to rise above, and to thrive in spite of all obstacles. And so part of this, I think, is the mindset that we sort of go into in the things that we encounter in our day to day and then just over the course of our longitudinal career. What are the things that are within our control? That's sort of what you see here in the orange circle. What are the things you definitely cannot control, which is totally outside of the circles? And what are the things in the gray area? Those are the things that you can't control as of the current moment, but maybe you can influence. And I think a lot of this resiliency uh, factor has to do with being able to identify that gray area of things where you know you can have an influence on either a division or department or clinic policy or how uh, resources are apportioned or those sorts of things. Those can be incredibly valuable opportunities for you to have that empowerment and agency as an individual to identify and bring 
those things into that sphere of influence. So when I come back to this stress strain curve that I showed earlier, obviously people are not materials, but the idea is there that uh, people can adjust and adapt, and the idea is to do it in a healthy way. The other part too is then the interaction between the individual and the system that they function in. So for example, that I showed in the last one with the spheres of control, and that sort of gray area where this overlap is between the individual and the system. The system itself also has an aspect of resilience that can be designed into it, which I'm gonna shift over to talk in about a little bit more. Obviously, the idea is that individual well-being is important, and you can do things for yourself. Everybody has their different ways to be able to maintain their well-being. Um, I'm not gonna focus on that so much today because I think there, there are resources that, for that that are available out there and also on the ACP websites that you can reference for that too. So what is system resilience? So system can be resilient if it can adjust its functioning prior to, during, or following events. So those events can be changes, disturbances, or opportunities. Um, and then sustain required operations under both the expected and unexpected conditions. And as you can imagine, there are different ways to think about how that influences the various levels of interaction. So you have society, community, organizational, and you're getting down into interpersonal interactions with each other in our communities of practice, and then also individual with each other individually, but also with our individual patients. So it's a little bit theoretical, but there's this balance when you're thinking about system resilience and the design of that resi resilience into the system. And when I say system, it can be, a again, a sort of department, it can be a whole healthcare system. Um, but the idea is there's a balance between job demands and job resources. So the demands are the things that I think we all know very well in our day-to-day -day practice as internists. Those are the things like physical, physiologic and psychological costs. There's also workload, time pressures. Maybe the responsibilities in your role, they can vary, or maybe sometimes they're not very clear. That can lead to conflict or ambiguity in the role that you're in. But what are the job resources that can balance those out? Those resources, um, can include things about the job itself, about working as a physician, but also the workflows that you work with, the systems like the electronic health records or other things that are available to you in your day-to-day -day work, your tools. There's also an aspect of social support. So that can be support from others who are in your immediate environment or support from others in settings like this, where you're meeting with people who are from other clinics and hospitals uh, or regions of the country. So the idea here is that we wanna balance those out and maybe make sure that those resources are properly matching the demands that you're experiencing in the setting that you work in or that you may be a leader of. Um, the reason is that at the bottom there, you can see that when there are increased job demands with inadequate resources, that can drive burnout. But if you can bolster those resources and increase the control that one can have in the job space and the workplace, um, including especially the social supports, that can mitigate the effect of the high job demands and the driver of burnout. So what else can fall into that aspect of job resources and providing support in the workplace? That can include things like workplace safety. So I think the first one is pretty self-evident. Physical safety is an important one, one that we experienced certainly during the COVID-19 pandemic. Physical safety when it comes to occupational exposures to infectious disease, having proper uh, personal protective equipment and other things. Um, and then also uh, physical safety, not only from environmental hazards because of the nature of the job, but also from other people. It's also, it's quite under-recognized, certainly in the United States, um, that workplace safety and workplace violence can be a major issue. And when I say workplace violence, that can mean violence from patients, family and caregivers towards physicians and other healthcare professionals but it can also include violence from peers and others who are also healthcare professionals towards us as well. So all of these factors are things that contribute to a sense of safety within the workplace. And lastly, there's psychological safety. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail about it, but it is important to be aware that psychological safety is also important. So what is it exactly? It's a climate in which people are comfortable expressing and being themselves. More specifically, when people have psychological safety in their work, 
they can feel comfortable sharing concerns and mistakes without a fear of embarrassment or retribution. And then they're confident that they can speak up, they won't feel humiliated, ignored, or blamed. And then they can ask questions, especially when they're unsure about something. You can imagine that having psychological safety also has its uh, positive consequences, where that can contribute also to better patient care and outcomes and better quality of care. Another aspect of having that psychological safety is the hidden curriculum. The ACP actually has a position paper about this, which if you're interested in learning more about this, I encourage you to read it. It's particularly relevant if you are a medical educator as well. So what is the hidden curriculum? It's the positive and the negative lessons that are embedded into an organizational structure and culture. Um, and they're often conveyed in medical schools, residency programs, hospitals, and clinics. So there can be positive and negative. What does that mean? So positive role models reinforce the character and the values that our profession as internists seeks to cultivate. But the negative ones are the ones we want to mitigate and reduce. So those are the ones that directly contradict, excuse me, that contradict classroom lessons and expectations of patient society and med medical, education, medical educators. So what else can we do other than being positive role models and ensure that we're passing on a positive hidden curriculum? Well, I mentioned before about the interpersonal aspect of having workplace safety in our own environments with each other. Um, and part of that means both being self-aware about your own well-being, but potentially being aware of warning signs or signs of distress that you observe in your peers. That can be incredibly important and helpful to provide that extra su social support and job resource to your colleagues who are in your workspace. So what are some of the signs of distress that you can see? Some of these are listed here. Um, and I also include the suicide warning signs. This is from the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention because I think they're often underestimated and overlooked. Um, it's very easy to skip over it, let's say, if you're in a busy you know, hospital ward day or that sort of thing. But it can be incredibly helpful and important to be able to acknowledge when your peer is in distress and to be supportive of them when you observe signs that you're concerned about. And so what can you do when a peer is in distress? These are also from the American Foundation of Suicide Prevention. Uh, what can you do is to be able to find the time to talk to a colleague in a quiet setting and to be able to listen actively and without judgment. It is always important in such settings in interacting with colleagues. And I say colleagues, but it also includes, for example, students or residents who you may mentor. Um, it's important to also reserve making solutions. So as internists, we our day-to-day -day involves treating patients, so diagnosing them, complex puzzles, coming up with solutions and treatments for them. In these cases, reserving the solution is actually very important to be able to hear and validate what the experience is of a peer who may be in distress. And then encourage them to seek treatment. So that is also an important part of the process where if you are concerned, to address directly if you are concerned about them, for example, having suicidal ideation or being in an acute mental health crisis, and then facilitating them to reach the help that they may need. So everything I've sort of said went from the individual level of resilience to sort of system level resilience, and then sort of what you can do within the workplace yourself immediately to pay attention to. Um, naturally, we work in teams. We don't work in isolation in providing care to the patients that we see from day to day. So when we think about successful teams, some of what I already discussed already contributes to that. Um, successful teams, they have a clear and compelling purpose or goal. They have an enabling social structure and the uh, job resources, as I mentioned, that facilitate teamwork. And the teamwork uh, and respect for colleagues must both be taught and demonstrated. So again, going back to hidden curriculum aspect, we want to promote that positive uh, hidden curriculum. Well, ideally it would be more explicit than that, um, but a positive influence on the curriculum to encourage our learners to be able to adopt this sort of teamwork mindset. And lastly, the learning environment should be psychologically safe. It should foster respect, inquiry, and honesty, and empower people to be able to raise concerns that they see. So to cult cultivate well-being in the uh, workplace, so in summary, resilience is not only a characteristic of an individual physician, clinician, or learner. 
Um, and personal strategies for growth and self and situa situational awareness can be a, a good foundation, but we cannot rely on the individual adaptability of individual physicians and learners. We must be able to implement and design institutional strategies like supporting the job resources, as I mentioned. Uh, additionally, we can expand our job resources beyond our own immediate work and learning environments. So again, coming back to spaces like this, where you're assembling from a variety of different locations, specialties and workplaces, this also, coming here to this annual meeting, is and can be a place to be able to expand your resources. And then sometimes going to back to basics, as is the theme of the, this meeting, is that that may just mean being present for someone else, a peer or a colleague, uh, when they're in distress or crisis. So I just want to leave for those who are sort of on the early career, more trainee side, uh, a few suggestions for how to proceed in advancing your career and professional growth. Some of this may also be very helpful for anyone who's mid-career or advanced stage career, as just a reminder. Um, to be able to build those networks and resources, uh, getting connected, growing your networks, gaining perspective, generating new ideas, and giving back are all ways to contribute to this community of practice that we have here in this chapter, but also throughout the ACP network and beyond. What does that mean, getting connected, finding mentors and sponsors? So mentors can give you the guidance in your, the work that you do in sort of your career direction. Sponsors are the ones who advocate for their sponsees or protégés and sort of bring them up with them uh, by being influential leaders. Growing your networks, like again here in a professional society that can expand your resource pool and having it be your professional home is a place to be able to make those connections as in the first the slide just preceding. Gaining perspective and knowledge. Um, I am learning already today as I'm here about, uh, for example, the uh, lamp lighting ritual, which was wonderful to participate in during the inaugural ceremony. Um, but being able to expand your perspective and your knowledge uh, across the world and about what else is going on in the world of internal medicine is incredibly valuable, enriching, and just very gratifying to experience. Generating new ideas. Um, the new ideas can come from grassroots. Um, oftentimes, I think that trainees and residents, they, they have a lot to contribute to our societies and our activities. Um, and being able to actively participate in those committees, councils, and other initiatives that can be a very important part of career growth and development. The QR code is just a resource there for the I Am Power ACP resources for residents. And the link is also at the bottom as well. And then lastly, give back. So a lot of you here today are already doing that by being leaders in the spaces where you are, by teaching, by mentoring, uh, and maybe even already sponsoring some of your trainees as well. So I'm going to stop it there um, and hopefully get us just a teeny tiny bit back on track in terms of time. But I'm happy to talk about any of these aspects in a little more detail or take any questions. Thank you so much for your attention.